In today's show, Rob Williams is set for knee surgery. Plus, we look at some trends from the Blazers' offense and defense and find out what's sustainable and what's got to change. Welcome to Locked On Blazers. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Trail Blazers, your daily Portland Trail Blazers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, world? It's your past first point guard and Trail Blazers reporter, Mike Richmond. You're listening to another episode of Locked on Blazers, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, available wherever you get podcasts and also on YouTube. Thanks for making this show your first listen every single weekday, coming at you Monday through Friday. So make it a part of your daily routine. Tell your friends to do the same and make your first listen. Locked on Blazers, your team every day. In today's episode, we got some bummer news about Rob Williams. And then we'll talk statistical trends. Uh, Williams headed for knee surgery. We'll discuss the impacts of that. Just a a stinker news early in the season. Uh, And then we'll talk about the Blazers' offensive shot profile, some things I've noticed and some offensive trends. And then we'll answer the question. The Blazers right now have a top 10 defense in the NBA. Seven games into this thing. Is that real? With 75 games left, is the defense real? That's what we'll do to close the show. Let's talk Rob Williams. Uh, First reported today by Adrian Wojnarowski of ESPN that Rob Williams is headed for knee surgery. Not 100% clear in the initial reporting from Woj uh, what the timeline is or what the deal is, but he's having surgery on his right knee. Uh, he's going to have conversations with his doctors and with his agent and with the Blazers on what the necessary procedure is going to be, and then they'll figure out the timeline. That's the initial reporting that we have. Then, a few minutes later, as they do, maybe maybe an hour later, as they do, Shams of The Athletic reports, along with Jared Weiss of The Athletic, that Rob Williams is facing two options. One, potential season-ending surgery to repair bone and ligament damage in his, in, in his right knee. He's got a kneecap injury and, you know, it would need a, a sort of more serious procedure that would cause him to miss the season. Or he could also choose a cleanup procedure where he'd only miss two to three months. So that's what Williams has to weigh. For other folks, I think you might lean, I want to play basketball this season. You know, it's November. If I'm out for you know three full months, I can be back in, in back in February, back in March, play meaningful games when they matter in the spring. But Rob Williams is facing something a little bigger than that because he had a cleanup procedure. He had the be- in the best year of his career, he tore his meniscus in March and decided to have surgery to to clean up his uh, clean up the knee, and he came back. In the playoffs, uh, you know, even missed a handful of games in the playoffs because he kept, you know, just dealing with recurring knee injury, but came back to play in the postseason, played up through the finals run, and the idea was that he couldn't make it any worse. That was March. He played into June, and then in September, he had to have a second knee surgery, and he missed a bunch of time right like then he had to then he was didn't play at the beginning of the season was limited last year and then coming off what was the best year of his career in 21 22 he just wasn't was not the same last season just appeared in just 35 games uh was playing fewer minutes was coming off the bench um just just from being perhaps the best defensive player in the league during the 21-22 season. I know he didn't win the award and one of his teammates did, but um, he was the anchor of one of the best defensive teams in the league and a team that made the finals to being someone who clearly wasn't himself last season fully. Two procedures on his left leg that just like don't kind of get right. And then he has this injury on Sunday evening uh, where, you know, Clearly hurt himself on, a, you know, took a funky step and got and, and had some, had some contact on the way down as well. It's not 100% clear to me watching it what happened, but looked like he kind of grimaced on a step and then fell down and then he got contacted as he was as he was going to ground. Immediately knew he was hurt, right? Like a, he was way late in the ground. Immediately knew he was hurt. Tried to sub out of the game, but they couldn't. Had to play an offensive possession when he was, uh, you know, hurt dealing with a a a. a a knee issue that he knew was a knee issue right away heads right to the back it stinks it stinks it's just a bummer for him um you know i will say that i felt like on this show you know i try to talk about everyone a little bit but you kind of you focus 
There's a lot of Shaden Sharp stuff, a lot of Scoot stuff, a lot of Malcolm Brogdon stuff, a lot of Amphrey Simon stuff, some, focusing on Jeremy Grant, Tony Kamara, and DeAndre Ayton. I feel like I've, I've missed out in the first seven games of really focusing and appreciating what Rob does. You know, he comes off, he's coming off the bench. He's playing these weird two big lineups with DeAndre Ayton a little bit, but he, I think he's been solid. I think he sets good screens. I think he's a solid playmaker. He's obviously an active and, and, and talented defender. Um, I kind of didn't, I didn't give him his, his due. I felt like I didn't, you know, listening back to some of the episodes as I do, uh, didn't feel like I gave, gave Rob his due for, for just being solid. He's just being a solid, you know, solid, solid player, solid contributor, solid, you know, a guy who could prop up the bench cause he's darn, he's darn good. And you always have like solid center minutes for the most part. Although, uh, De- DeAndre has some struggles, so maybe you don't always have some solid, uh, center minutes, but now it's you know the sort of I guess the best case scenario is that is that is that Williams returns in 2024, um, sometime to the Blazers lineup. But it just stinks. It's stinky news. Um, it, there's ripple effects, obviously, with the roster. Uh, what do they do? I will say it's not. It has not. Rob missed one game earlier this year. It was against the Toronto Raptors, second night of a back-to-back, and they held him out. Uh, you know, he didn't play in preseason. He banged knees with Jeremy Grant in training camp. Even he didn't before hitting knees with Jeremy Grant in training camp. They were, you know, they said he was late to training camp, so they were. he didn't play in the first preseason game because he was ramping up. You'll note that uh, Malcolm Brogdon arrived at the same time, all, did play in that preseason game. So, like, they were being pretty conservative with, with Rob. They probably knew that his body was... Um, you know, that he was still getting right after, you know, a, a year post that knee surgery. And... Um, kind of still still trying to, to, to figure it out, right? And they were going to be cautious with him because they knew he'd had, you know, multiple knee surgeries and, and, and injuries and stuff like that. And, like, they wanted to have him for the long haul, holding him out of, of back-to-backs. You know, they, they probably they probably knew that he was, um, you know, someone who's had, who's had a history of, of injuries and they need to be conservative when you have someone with history of injuries and certainly they've seen his medicals up close. In that game where he didn't play, though, the Blazers um, didn't play another center. They stayed in a super small lineup with uh, Jabari Walker and Tumani Kamara, and a little and 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 uh, played played the young wings in big lineups. But the Raptors don't have punishing big backup centers. They're playing Chris Boucher as a backup center. Um, it's just different. You know, you you can get away with it on the glass. You can get away with it physically because because Boucher is just like skinny jump shooter uh it'll be curious if when the blazers play teams that are big and stay big in the second unit uh you know particularly la who they play on friday the the lakers uh w- will we see moses brown you know he's on the roster i think there's a chance that duop wreath plays you know he's a two-way guy he has not been active in any of the games but he's been around when i've been in the arena both both home games he's been uh that i've attended he's been he's you know he's warming up before the game watching film working with coaches all that stuff um he has not been active for games but i, I assume that brown would get the nod ahead of wreath but um wreath was more productive player for certain in preseason so it wouldn't surprise me but i think if we're just going off chauncey billups's preference his preference is definitely to not play a traditional center behind deandre and he wants to play the he he trusts who he trusts right like even it's he, it's pretty clear um billups is kind of he does it right out in front of you you know who he trusts already there's there's typically not many surprises um and so i think if if they can get away with it the blazers will not play a backup center they will go small in those second units but if they have to i would assume it's moses brown first and then wreath but it wouldn't surprise me if it's a wreath ahead of brown um it's just same thing with like what skylar mays is dealing with now when you're a two-way guy you only have 50 nba games you could play before they have to convert you to a regular contract convert you to an nba deal um i think the blazers are clearly comfortable doing that with mays if it comes to it um whether they would be comfortable doing that with wreath and using that roster spot on another center i think is a question that they will answer by how they handle this injury um i'm bummed for rob i'm bummed for blazer fans it stinks it stinks it's no good for anybody injuries suck um, they're part of the game, but they're just a bad part of it. <laughs> they're a bad part of it that no one enjoys. Um, I hope it. I hope whatever the the resolution is, and whether Rob Williams is you know plays a bunch of games for the Blazers or ends up on another team, because certainly um, it's been rumored that other teams are after him or have been inquiring about him. And even Adrian Wojnarowski in his tweet mentioned that other teams had had called and been interested, right? And like, um, if the Blazers are gonna 
can you know sell off players basically to to worry about the future and not the present a healthy rob williams is absolutely someone who can help in the present so whether he's a blazer for a long time or ends up on another team i hope he plays i hope he plays and i hope he's i hope he can get it right and and be a contributor um and if he does elect to go for the season ending route i hope whatever team he's on next season that he's someone who can be a regular high minute contributor because um it stinks when bodies break down on good players and robert williams is just a straight up good player so uh always rooting for anybody but but it's it's a true bummer. Okay, second segment. Let's let's shift gears a little bit. I want to, as promised at the top of the show, I want to talk a little bit about the Blazers' offense and defense. We'll start with the offense. Um, some thoughts I've noticed and some some trends that aren't quite trends, but I bet they will be numbers to know about the Blazers' offense. That's what we'll talk about in the second segment. First, let's talk about FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now is a great time. Great time to get involved. We're at the midway point of the NFL season, and right now new customers can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. It's $150 if your team wins. So uh, go on FanDuel, use their app, super easy to use, super intuitive, and bet somebody to outright win. That's what a money line bet is. You'll see it at the end of the betting odds. You say, okay, yeah. I like that. I, th- I I do believe the Colts are going to win in Germany this Sunday. Um, <laughs> they're going to go there. Uh, international travel will not phase them, and they're going to get a win. Uh, and that's a 6 a.m. tip off at the Pacific time. So Sunday morning, you place your bet, $5 on the Colts. Colts win. By the time you wake up and are watching football, you get 150 bucks to play with. Then you can bet on everything from spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. Visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to, to learn more about it. That's FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. And kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, an official partner of the NFL. All right. The Blazers have now been a good offensive team this season. I think that's pretty obvious if you've watched the games. They're gonna, they've struggled. They just, they don't, they don't have a ton of shooting. They don't have a ton of playmaking. Um, they're just gonna struggle, right? Like I think there's gonna be moments that are really fun, but they're just, they're, they're, they're somewhat limited. But some of the ways that they can mitigate is maybe too strong of a word. Some of the ways that they can get around or sneak past some mitigation here and there they're uh, just like uh, skills right on offense like some of it's just gonna be skill set is how they where they shoot and how they attack i don't think they're ever going to be a good three-point shooting team this year with this personnel they just don't they don't have it uh but they can be a smart shooting team and that will be meaningful i thought to begin the season it was very clear they were taking way too many mid-range jumpers very clear and that's going to happen Jeremy Grant wants to ISO in the mid-range and they let him um they don't they, he stopped doing that a little bit a little bit on Sunday but they, they let him uh, in the most recent game he, he bombed away from three took 13 threes um which uh, heck Jeremy Grant's gonna shoot too much let's let him shoot too much from three-point range that's kind of the theme of this segment here in the middle but um it's Jeremy Grant wants to operate there. DeAndre Ayton wants to operate from between three and fifteen feet, right? Like he doesn't he he doesn't dunk and he doesn't shoot threes. He operates in the middle. Um, that's it's it's where he's it's where he's gonna is where he wants to go. Malcolm Brogdon takes a lot of pull up mid range jumpers. Uh, Shaden Sharp has explored with that mid range. Uh, when Amphrey Simons was healthy, he's kind of, he takes a lot of floater range shots and not shots all the way at the rim. And early in the season, it felt like they were just taking too many hard mid range jumpers, not enough threes, and some of that's just like, um. That personnel, right? They don't have the bombers away from three to take a bunch of threes, but and it's not as simple as get to the rim. Like I think it's when we, I think sometimes people like me and myself included, uh, we will say like, well, they got to get to the rim more. Not everyone can just get to the rim, right? If you could take a layup on every play, it'd be easy. If if, if, if if not everyone has the skill sets with the, their athleticism and their ball handling skills get, to get themselves from not at the rim to the rim to playing a basketball game. It's just the truth of it. So some of it is being judicious with the mid-range pull-ups you take. Another problem with mid-rangers is they are typically unassisted. Threes, assisted. Layups can be assisted. Um, but mid-rangers, no one is curling to the mid-range off NBA actions. You're not, there's just there's just so few mid-range jumpers that are going to be unassisted. They are, by virtue, harder to take two-pointers because they are not, they're further away from the rim. And also, they're harder to take because you're going to set them up yourself. And it felt like in the beginning of the year, the Blades were settling for way too many. 
And I thought when I was going to look at their wins, right, at, at three and four, that I was going to find an obvious trend. And then when they, when they attacked the rim and they, they got shots in the, in, at the rim, they were going to be a much more successful team. And when they took, you know, way more mid-range jumpers, they were going to be, um, they were going to struggle. And there is some truth to that, but they took way more shots at the rim than they took middies in that game against Philly, and they got waxed. And then they came out the next night, and they took way more mid-range jumpers, 31, compared to 19 shots at the rim against Toronto. What'd they do? They won, baby! They pulled out, they pulled out a victory, the beginning of three in a row in Toronto. Um, I don't think the stats necessarily bear it out. Uh, the game on Friday against the Memphis Grizzlies, which they came back, they shot terribly in that game 40 percent from the field 30 percent from three down 10 with three minutes left and they found a way to win but the shot profile was awesome 46 shots at the rim 18 for 18 at mid-range jumpers 32 threes that's a that's a great shot profile but against detroit the night before 27 shots at the rim 33 mid-range jumpers this is data courtesy of the indispensable stats website cleaning the glass in the win over the, the 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 Raptors, like I said, way more mid-range jumpers than rim shots. And against Detroit and against Memphis, they dominated the free throw battle. They they, they plus twenty something against Detroit, plus twenty something. They took uh, thirty six to eleven, and then and then plus twenty something against Memphis uh, in thirty three to to ten free throw, thirty three to twelve free throws rather. Massive, massive, massive disparities. Against in the Memphis game on Friday, though, they attacked the rim, and the data says it. In the Detroit game, they took more mid-range jumpers than, than free throw attempts. They just got into the bonus way early in the fourth quarter, and it worked out in their favor. Some of the stuff is out of your control. It's the way the other team defends. The, 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 the Pistons fouled way too much. On Sunday, when they lost to the Grizzlies, they took more rim shots 27 the mid-range jumpers 23 and they really bombed away from three 40 45 attempts from three which is probably too many for their personnel but if you went back and watched those threes not many of them are like truly bad looks i mean jabari walker missed five three-pointers in the game he should take all five of those if he gets a chance again all of them were good looks uh late in the game malcolm brogdon was missing jumpers shaden drops missing jumpers they're playing 40-some minutes a night. Maybe they're just tired shooting front rim. Those are good looks. I don't, I really, I don't really have a problem with that, that shot profile. I want them to shoot more threes. Certainly, I think like um, they took 20 against the Pistons and won. Like that's, they, it was just a weird game. Uh, but you say like, okay, well, two of those games, they tacked the rim. Um, they, they took a bunch of free throws. Well, in the game against the Toronto Raptors, they didn't even get up to, they didn't even get to 20 free throws. Took 15. It wasn't a big free throw night. So what I'll say, this is just this is just the problem with with pointing to stat. This is the challenge, not the problem. The challenge of pointing to statistical trends with just seven games. It's just a small number. But I will say this: this is a pre- this is more predictive, and I think you can see it with your eyes better than the numbers bear it out. When I went to the numbers, when I went to clean the glass, I thought I would see a different story. I didn't see a different story, but I think. Um, I'm willing to wager that this will this will uh, bear out over the course of you know 25 games or whatever it is 30 games to start the season even seven more get get it let's get up to 14 that when the Blazers are more aggressive when the Blazers shoot more shots at the rim than they do mid range jump shots they will be consistently more effective because they will. Their whole goal is free throw. There is 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 possessions, right? So they need free throws to have more shooting possessions. Um, they need to get to the rim to draw fouls, the, and mid range jumpers are just harder shots to take. It's just like a bunch of you know, it's going to be like a bunch of Jeremy Grant ISO jumpers, and that's like a hard diet to live on. And if you are going to take a bunch of Jeremy Grant ISO jumpers, let's just have them be three pointers. <laughs> let's have them be three pointers. Uh, you know, against Memphis on Sunday night, the Blazers didn't get enough shots in the paint. Absolutely. They got a ton of shots, 55 shots in the paint, 47, at, 46 at the rim on Friday, but 55 shots in the paint. I think that's a good number to go on and a number that they will be successful, more successful with going forward. You can't really 
you know, the, like the shooting is going to be shooting all year long. They're going to miss threes. I think you still want them to take in the 30 range. 45 is probably too many for this group, but like 30 threes is the right number. I think less than that would be a mistake. 35 threes is a great number for them. Uh, less that would be a mistake. Like those shots are worth more points. And um, you want Tumani Kamara and you want Jabari Walker and you want Matisse Thibel. If those guys are going to be in the game and spacing, you want them taking threes and not... Um, if they can't get layups and you can't get layups every time down the floor, that's probably a better shot for your play finisher types on the roster. I'm going to, I'm going to say now, and I'll track this throughout the season is like rim attempts and paint attempts are going to be an indicator of the Blazers offensive success. How often do they get to the rim? How often do they get into the paint? It'll be more assisted looks, more drives to the rim, which leads to more free throws, which leads to the, them winning the possession battle because you just want more shooting possessions in the game. That's going to be key for them. I think that's the that's I've been trying to find a trend that I think will be the will be the one that I will circle and say this would be you know this will be the dameless minutes of the future. That shot profile, paint attempts, rim attempts is going to be the the number one thing I'm going to be watching over the course of the next seven games. And when we get to game fifteen, I will or game fourteen right before game fifteen, I will I, we will revisit this and talk about what we have learned and what we know and whether this has. Um, whether the shot profile thing has borne out because I think this is who they are, right? I think this is their team that's going to struggle on offense. So you got to simplify it and take easier looks. And typically, not always, but typically mid range jumpers are more difficult looks. Blazers might be 30th on offense, but they are a top 10 defense right now as I'm recording this. Uh, the games have ended on Monday evening. Uh, you're listening to Tuesday, November 7th show. Get out there and vote. Um, it's election day uh, in at least my part of the world. Uh, so, uh, but they're pretty good on defense, right? They're pretty good. Seven games in. Is this real? I don't know. But I do know if it's going to be real, the most important numbers that have to stay where they are. That's what we will talk about to close the show. The most important defensive numbers to know before we do that. Let's talk about Jace Medical. Look, you've heard me tell you about Jace Medical in the past and the Jace Case, but it's not only life-saving antibiotics that Jace Case is offering, excuse me, Jace Medical is offering. They're also, and I have just become aware of this, is that you can get a one-year supply of ED medications through Jace Medical. You realize what that means? That means that you can bring ED medication on extended travel. You can have it with, with any challenges that come up, supply chain issues, uh, you know, big weather that disturbs things getting to you, be it whatever that might be, you're covered. You don't have to worry about whether you can refill your generics for Cialis or Viagra or whatever it might be. And this is possible because Jace Medical delivers. So go online right now jacemedical.com to receive your 12 month supply of your daily medication. Remember to use the promo code locked on at checkout for a discount as well. Listen, Jace, Jace verified customer had this to say about their service. I'm thankful for the service. Supply chain issues caused me to cut pills in half to have it. I ordered most of my daily meds with a year's supply. I also ordered an antibiotic kit. I feel secure now. Prices are lower than local pharmacies. I highly recommend this to everyone. If that's a testimonial that seems like you seems like you want to get on board, and if you or someone you love needs peace of mind by having a year supply of any daily medication, not just ED pills, but any daily med, go to jaysmedical.com to see... If it's offered for you, and remember, use the promo code Locked On for twenty dollars off your purchase. Still a pass first point guard. I'm still Mike Richmond. You are still listening to Locked On Blazers. We talked about the Blazers' offense, not good, but I think where they shoot from and how they attack will be the most important thing we kind of learn about them as the season goes on. That will be a great indicator. What what are they doing? But on defense, they've been good statistically to start the year. Uh, according to NBA.com, still ninth after Monday's games. They hung on in the top 10, baby. They're a top 10 defense through seven games. 
Is this a meaningful sample size? No, no, it is not. And I don't mean to paint it as such because when I was doing research for the second segment, I realized that there's just been some weird games. They played some weird freaking games. Uh, the game against Toronto, the Raptors missed 25 three-pointers. A weird freaking game. Uh, the game against Detroit, the Pistons just could not score down the stretch. Memphis was awful on offense basically in both games until the final eight minutes on Sunday after just... They were bad on Friday. The Blazers were also pretty darn bad. And the, and it's not like Memphis was a lot better on Sunday. They just played well down the stretch when the Blazers' offense totally disappeared. Uh, Blazers' offense only available for 40 minutes. Final eight minutes not available. It's kind of weird games. Like, th this early in the season, there's just too much noise to say ninth. They're ninth. They're top ten. Chauncey Billups has got it figured out. The the better better defensive personnel and the, and Billups is coaching and they've got it going on right. And I think that would be silly. I mean, I I think actually it would make for good radio. Maybe I should have just maybe I should have just led with that take, but I don't believe it. And one of the things I really like to do here on the show, one of the things I pride myself on, is I stand on on what I believe. So sometimes I get accused of being a little bit of a hater, but like a little bit of a hater or maybe a pessimist, but like. I'm not going to lie for good radio. I'm going to tell you what I think, and I'm going to try to walk you along the walk that I've taken so you can at least see my line of thinking. I don't know if the Blazers are going to be good on defense this year. Um, I think losing Rob Williams for an extended period of time, and perhaps the rest of the season, that's really going to be a challenge to their defense uh, because they were always going to have a quality center on the court with, with Williams or D.A., um, now it's Moses Brown, who's just like, does not look like an NBA player, or Duop Reith, who has literally never played in the NBA, or Tumani Kamara and, and Jabari Walker playing the five, um, which you can get away with sometimes, but uh, not every team. You, can, you just can't do it against every team. I think the shooting variance, like if Toronto just like makes a normal number of three-pointers, <laughs> maybe the Blazers are not top 10 in, uh, in defense, right? Um it, Toronto, Detroit, Memphis, Memphis. These are uh, teams that were all very bad offenses last year. Memphis has been horrific as a half-court offense the last two years. They just have avoided it by being really good on defense and forcing a bunch of turnovers, right? Like, um, you know, these are teams are these are these are not. Uh, I'm willing. I'm pretty comfortable thinking that Detroit's gonna be bad on offense this year all all year long. Um, and yet, if this is real, because I don't know, I, I'm skeptical. But if it's real. There are two key things that are going to be the, the, the what makes this sustainable. One, and I should acknowledge this first, the most important thing that, I, that matters on any team is, is, is the players. The players dictate it. Coaching uh, matters and, and, and the plan matters. Absolutely, like what the coach wants you to do and does he get you to buy in and do, do you do these things? And like that matters. But the number one thing always, the, 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 at the top of the list always is just your talent, right? Your talent. And I do think the Blazers are a have better and particularly when Rob was healthy but better defensive personnel than they had a year a year ago uh, I think Tamari Kamara is an upgrade I think Matisse Thibel is an upgrade I think playing less minutes with Anthony Simons and, and Damian Lord is just like straight up better for your defense um, playing minutes playing a bunch of minutes with those two dudes together not going to be a good defensive team um, Ants played one game I, I don't think like Scoot Henderson is like a massive upgrade over Anthony Simons on defense he's probably worse um but like they're better. I think Shaden Sharp has struggled a little bit on defense, but his defensive playmaking has been great. Get blocking shots, getting steals, making plays. Um, he's just sort of like fundamental stay in front of guys. Make sure you f find your, when you're playing off ball defense, you know where your man is. See man, see ball. Like that has been, has been a little bit problemat problematic for him, but like the, just like the natural playmaking gifts on defense, fast hands, fast feet, fast brain. It's been great. And that's the key to this defense being sustainable. The defensive personnel is a little bit better. So you think they might be better than they were last year when they were awful. They've been really bad the last four seasons. Um, if they were fully healthy, I would think this could be like a chance to be sustainable because Rob Williams is a really good defensive player. They're not. And teams are never fully healthy. That's just the nature of the sport. But right now, the Blazers are sixth enforcing opponent turnovers that playmaking from Shaden Sharp where he maybe hasn't been a great team defender but he's made some great plays some great plays on defense they're sixth in opponents turnover uh, opponent tur forcing turnovers opponent turnover percentage sixth that's great they were 20th a year ago that has to stay there 
make plays on defense, get out and run, block shots, get steals, force turnovers, force bad passes. Uh, I will say, if, if nothing else, this Blazers, this version of the Blazers plays hard. Uh, they shoot bricks, but they play hard. Um, and it's easy to root for them because they play hard. Sixth in opponent's turnover percentage. Huge number. Again, that's courtesy of cleaningtheglass.com. And they're keeping folks off the line. That's been crucial. Defending without fouling. Forcing turnovers, not fouling. Hard to do both, but right now they're doing it. They're 11th in opponent free throw rate. Huge. Last year, they were 22nd. They're bottom 10 in the league in forcing turnovers, bottom 10 in the league in keeping folks off the free throw line. They didn't force turnovers. They gave up free throws. This year, they're forcing turnovers. I think DA's been great. DeAndre Ayton's been, in terms of defensive playmaking, he had a five-steal game this year, right? Um, he's... he's uh, I, it's like, it's, I'm, I don't know if I'm predicting that he's going that, that he's going to have m- many many of those in the future, but like he's he's been competitive on defense. He's been competitive on defense. I've I said on the yesterday show, it's like um, I don't think the Blazers have a good plan for how to use him on offense, and that's a problem. But it it has yet to translate to him not bringing it on defense. He's brought it. He's been he's been really competitive. Matisse Thibault, Tamani Kamara, the competitiveness that you get from uh, Jabari Walker, the just like general, he's not like a lockdown guy, but general competence you get from from Jeremy Grant. Uh, you know, Malcolm Brogdon knows where to be and is, is competitive on defense. Uh, Shaden Sharp wants to play defense. Uh, he doesn't always play it smart, but he wants to play defense and make plays, and I think he, he can end up being a good defensive player. They've, they've Defending without fouling, causing turnovers. That That's the key to sustain, sustainability on defense. Is it real? I mean... I don't th- no. I don't think they'll end up being top ten all year long. I, I would imagine that they'll be a below average defense when the dust settles at the end of the season. But if it's going to be real, those are the two keys. Those are absolutely the two numbers you need to know, and we'll track them all year long. Forcing turnovers, limiting free throws. Um, you know, you can't. Some teams are better at drawing fouls. Like it's a skill. It's a skill that some players have. So you can't do it against it every night. But over the course of a season, if defending without fouling can be is a skill of de- of of defensive players. Um, I will say this: the Blazers have dropped the zone a bunch. They were playing it. They're, they're stopped. Said stop playing the zone a bunch. They're playing it way too much beginning of the season. They're having trouble with it. We haven't seen it as much. We have not seen it as much. And. Um, that's a good thing because they struggled at it. I like the idea of playing multiple defenses, um, but uh, the execution of it was a nightmare. And if you play more man-to-man and you play more 55 is the call for them to switch. you hear it on the bench. 55, 55 is where they switch everything. Switch everything, get after it. Like, uh, not always. You obviously play to your opponents, but switch everything, get after it. Pressure on switches, show, show on ball screens, force turnovers, and run. That's their path. That's their path. You know what happens when you run? You get rim attempts. You don't take mid-range jumpers. You take open threes in transition and rim attempts. Uh, it'll Your shot profile will be influenced by your defense. Turnover percentage and limiting, limiting free throws. Those are the two key numbers. If the def- defense is going to be sustainable, that's what you need to know. And that's what you need to know for today's show. Tomorrow's show, preview the Blazers' road trip. They got two road games uh, beginning a week on the road. Sort of. They're going to come back between these games. But a week a week on the road, uh, Sacramento and L.A. We will look ahead to those two games on, on Wednesday's show ahead of the Sacramento game. Uh, tell your friends about this podcast. Thursday's show, we will... We will talk what we learned from the Kings Friday. We'll look a little bit ahead to the Lakers uh, a little more specifically and uh, and do some more fun stuff, trying to get a, an interview for Friday's show as well. So what we do five days a week, wherever you get podcasts. If you enjoy the show, tell your friends about the program. It's wherever they get podcasts and also on YouTube. I appreciate you listening. I'll talk to you soon.